It's a special delight for me to, to talk about a trip that Larry and Sergey and I had, took in October to go to Kazakhstan. Uh, it's not a place that you would normally visit, but it is a fascinating place, and it has a history that goes back to the origins of, our, of the space program in the, in the world and, of course, the American response. Um, as part of that, we met a very, very interesting person whose name is Rich Garriott, who indeed was the founder of games that you all grew up with called the Ultima Games, uh, and whose father was an astronaut on missions in 1973 and 1981. Uh, and it's interesting to, to meet a person through their family because he was behind the glass. And I'll tell you, the family is great. I think he's pretty good, too. <laughs> but having said that, we watched uh, one of the most amazing things that you can ever see. Uh, three people headed out to space uh, in a rocket that did not blow up and launched on time. And in fact, I lost a bet to one of the other fellow travelers on the, on the trip because he said that, 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 you will lo that I owed him some amount of money if it didn't launch within four seconds of launch. Now, can you imagine if we applied that rule in all the other space programs? And that's how impressive the Russian space program turned out to be. So I think what's most interesting today is we're not only going to hear what it's like to go through that process, but also what it's like to spend six months, eight months in that world a culture which has produced these enormous, enormously interesting achievements and one which we don't know very much about. So with that, I think Sergei wanted to say something. Where is Sergei? In fact, Ser Sergei is dressed up. He's dressed up in all red or also known in his bike, in his bike outfit. Okay, well, I wanted to tell a quick story before uh, we bring Richard up here. Could you have uh, dressed a little bit more formally for work? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been recording all my movements. I have two GPSs on me and a heart rate monitor. <laughs> Just a little project for fun. It wouldn't have worked if uh, Richard had done that, I suppose, by the time you're going at the orbital velocity. The GPS probably doesn't work. Um, anyhow, so uh, we were, uh, we all went to see uh, Richard off kind of the night before the launch. Uh, he was behind this glass and uh, all protected and all the people there were wearing masks because you don't want to get somebody sick uh, right as they uh, go into space. Uh, but we got a chance to chat with him. We asked him, well, what are you taking up? And obviously, one of the most important things he was taking was a camera. And uh, then he was discussing the memory that he was taking up, um, which was, you know, he had like four gig and eight gig cards or something like that. And I thought, my goodness, this guy is going to space. And I have to have like 32 gig cards on me because I brought to, you know, record the launch and whatnot. And whenever a new size comes out, I, uh, I swiftly order some. Uh, so anyhow, so I said, hey, Richard, I got some bigger memory for you. You want to take it? Uh, and uh, in fact, he did. Uh, and uh, so now he has returned it to me today. He just showed it to me. <laughs> um, so this memory, uh, and uh, I might actually pop it out of the case at some point and download the data. <laughs> um, but this is the memory chip that has gone to space. I, I suppose I should send PNY a little note. They can say space certified now. So, so for First the memory chip, and then the Sergey is going to space, right? <laughs> well, as, uh, as probably most of you know, but perhaps not all, uh, I have uh, put a deposit down on a slot, which, uh, which periodically I have opportunities to take up, and P. Peter always informs me when the launch dates are, and I've, I'm still contemplating it. Uh, though certainly uh, seeing Richard off and seeing him, more importantly, seeing him now back and alive. <laughs> That's right. Um, and a, good we should also mention a picture-perfect landing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I wasn't there for the landing, but I heard it went really nicely, uh, as opposed to the prior two. But anyway, everybody came out okay in those all, uh, in any case. So as long as everyone survives, I suppose it's a good landing. Uh, without further ado, Richard Garriott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and on that chip, by the way, I really did actually use that chip uh, specifically to uh, video the reentry and landing uh, sequence. Uh, and the data is still on the chip. So if you go stick in a computer, you'll see it. And I have that video with me today. And so if we end up with some time at the end, I'll uh, uh, show that to you. Uh, but let's see here. Let me uh, first I want to show you the first thing I want to show you is a little uh, uh, a video uh, piece. Uh, hang on a moment here. Uh, this is a, a trailer that was put together by a documentary crew that followed me around uh, all this year. Uh, they're, they're producing a documentary that hopefully will uh, show up at uh, 
uh, on a channel sometime in the near Please future. Please welcome Richard Garriott. I'm a computer game developer. On October 12th, I will launch and become the first second generation American astronaut. I was up there on the second flight for essentially two months. What you have here is some footage that hasn't been seen anywhere before, it hasn't been experienced before. This entire year I've been uh, in Star City, just outside of Moscow, training. The view is going to be fantastic and you'll remember it for the rest of your life. Your father had the right stuff, but in my opinion you have even righter stuff. Thirty million dollars. This is the goal that I have really been working towards for 20 to 30 years. Probably the most complex experiment that I will be performing involves protein crystal growth. Peach juice with pulp. I think the demand for private access to space is going to continue to grow and grow. Everyone's advice has been wear a diaper, plan to use it. Uh, doing this last year, uh, but uh, uh, you know, as uh, as you, many of you may know, and we're just told to if you if you didn't already know, uh, you know, my uh, real job, so to speak, uh, historically has uh, been that I've been a, a computer game developer. Uh, so I want to first kind of uh, lead you on kind of my journey to space. And what I find interesting is that there's a, a strange heavy overlap be people, between people in the high-tech industry and interest in space. And I don't know why that is, but uh, uh, you know, almost all the people who have privately gone to space have come from the high-tech industry. Uh, a lot of the people who are in either investing in or building rockets, suborbital or orbital rockets, come from the high-tech industry or the computer industry. Uh, and I'm definitely no exception there. You know, <clears throat> and uh, you know, but if I really kind of sat down and said, you know, what 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 really motivates me, what drives me to do all of these things, I find them very deeply related. Uh, you know, I, I consider myself uh, somewhat, if I in my own vision of myself anyway, I consider myself an explorer. Uh, but fundamentally, I consider myself a storyteller, whether that's through the digital medium or what I'm doing right now with you guys today. Uh, and, you know, I tend to collect these stories, and this goes back, even if you go to my home in Austin, Texas, anybody that's been there uh, would uh, agree that, you know, my home is full of secret passageways, it's got an observatory dungeon, indoor outdoor pools with artificial rain, and just all kinds of really crazy features, and I, I'm building now my third home, and each of my homes I've kind of designed myself, and they get kind of stranger and wackier uh, iteration after iteration. And then my house is filled with objects that I tell stories about. And whether that's, uh, I have uh, you know, one of the largest collections of automatons, uh, I think, in the world. I have a bunch of antique scientific instruments, a whole bunch of space artifacts, of course. Down in my dungeon, I have dead people and dead things. Um, you know, and I get this uh, from my parents, you know, uh, as you've heard, my father was a NASA astronaut, went up on Skylab 2, as well as the ninth uh, launch of the space shuttle. And if you keep an image, that first patch there with the Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of man, you'll notice that was uh, a similar symbol that I used as the, as the core of my mission patch. And in fact, there it is there. Um, and I get kind of the art side from my mother. Uh, who, uh, you, know, you know, not only uh, taught me to do various things like this, uh, anybody who knows my games in the Ultima series may recognize this snake necklace that I wear. I've actually worn this since I was 11 years old when I made it, and I, at the time I didn't know how to make a clasp, so it's permanently attached, other than they made me take it off for launch, and, uh, but I quickly put it back on once I was in space. And uh, uh, that, uh, but, but art projects and, and doing big uh, kind of themed events, uh, I really picked up that uh, desire from my mother. And so that kind of led me into the field of high-tech art. And I think of computer games really as the quintessential high-tech art. And, uh, but I got in <clears throat> you know, back in the uh, mid-70s when uh, you know, state-of-the-art technology was a you know, teletype and an acoustic modem and paper tape spools. Uh, when I was in junior high, I began to uh, uh, develop the storylines that ultimately became the Ultima series. So here, here's a, I'm getting a, an A, in, a rare A in an English class uh, while writing the, what really is the backstory to the Ultima series. 
And when the Apple II came out, uh, you can see I began to build these. Uh, uh, the upper right-hand drawing is a, uh, my mother's drawing to show me how to draw perspective from an artist's perspective, uh, from an artist's uh, vantage point. Uh, and then I kind of worked out the geometry to begin to uh, draw lines on an Apple II and, and make the 3D dungeons uh, that became uh, the foundation of the Ultima series. And uh, with that series, you know, my brother and I have been constant business partners over the last 25 years. And of course, as with many uh, great high-tech companies, started in our garage, literally. And, uh, you know, we'd use the living room as our production office to fold up boxes that we then put our hand-copied discs in and ship them out across the country. And for, you know, 20-some-odd uh, years, I wrote a series of games called Ultima that hopefully some of you have uh, heard of before. Uh, and then uh, somewhat more recently, you know, the last of the Ultima series was something called Ultima Online, which kind of uh, began, uh, you know, kind of opened the door to a, what's now the fastest growing segment of gaming, which is online gaming. Um, and, but all that, that journey, all that kind of what I call creative expression, that's all for me inspired by what I do in what I call my explorations of the reality in which we live. And, you know, when I choose to go on holiday, so to speak, uh, you know, I don't do it in a traditional way. I don't usually go on a cruise and sit back and eat and uh, catch rays. Uh, you know, for me, not only to go to really ex what I consider fairly extreme places down the Amazon or into the center of Antarctica, things of this nature, but I always go not just to take pictures and leave nothing but footprints, but also to go find scientific samples that I can bring back for universities and things of this nature. So, for example, when I went to Antarctica, went meteorite hunting, sent 40 meteorites back to universities, uh, took ice core samples that we sent to different uh, scientists to look for extremophile life forms. Uh, when I took uh, submarine trips that a, so friends of ours uh, uh, charter the Mir submersibles that they were used to film the movie Titanic, and uh, we take them down to places like hydrothermal vents, uh, where is another great place to go find extremophile life forms that I've brought up, sent back to my dad's uh, labs in Huntsville. We've actually cultured some of these uh, unique extremophile bacteria, extracted proteins from those, and we actually market those proteins. So. It's uh, it's really almost it's uh, it's almost a business if you might you might say uh, more than a vacation, uh, but that's just uh, you know what I enjoy doing and <clears throat> here's some examples of us uh, collecting some of those uh, samples at hydrothermal vents and you know we have to take doors full of liquid nitrogen to keep things uh, cryogenically frozen on the way in and out uh, you know so we we mount you know reasonably serious uh, expeditions and this career in gaming has funded. Uh, my, uh, my other passion of, of, of wanting to help uh, bring the civilian uh, space industry or private space travel into existence. And so I've been, throughout my gaming career, I've had some financial planners that kind of uh, supposedly invest on my behalf, uh, but occasionally I'll make uh, my own decisions for where to spend some of that money, and almost universally that has gone towards the privatization of space. And while some of the early uh, adventures didn't work out very well, which taught me the lesson of astronauts are hired for their science skill or their test pilot skills, not for their business acumen. Uh, and so I quickly learned that the best people to uh, partner with uh, aren't necessarily insiders, uh, so to speak, within, that, uh, uh, within the business that already exists, but the entrepreneurs coming in from the outside were where it really became most successful. And in fact, um, uh, some of you may have already heard, I've, I've technically now, I've retired from my most recent company, NCSoft, and uh, I'm now actually, uh, just as of a couple days ago, I'm, I'm full-time with uh, Space Adventures, uh, it says I have a lot, a lot of space stuff now to wrap up, and I'm also one of the trustees of the XPRIZE, and I have been, uh, you know, one of the uh, initial supporters and uh, long-term uh, members of the XPRIZE uh, that you have uh, Spaceship One, I noticed, hanging out here uh, yourselves. But... Uh, uh, but, you know, organizations like the XPRIZE, Zero-G Corp, and Space Adventures, I really think have really now opened the door to space. Uh, even my, my philanthropy, a lot of it is related to the same category, you know, where the, the Challenger Center, which was going to be, uh, was an offshoot of the Challenger accident, uh, which was going to be the teacher in space flight. Uh, June Scobie, the wife of Commander Dick Scobie, was actually my high school science teacher since all my neighbors were astronauts back then. Uh, and all the community was uh, astronauts and their relatives. And so I helped them kick off what's now 50 Challenger Centers around the globe that are kind of space science education facilities where they have uh, uh, shuttle simulations that students go through. Uh, and groups like the Nature Conservancy just happens to be a charity that I'm particularly fond of that I also partnered with in my mission that I'll talk about. 
But for many years, even though I was backing all this and trying to go into space myself, uh, there really there weren't there the option to go actually to space didn't exist. So, but I still participated a lot of it in it a lot uh, in what you might call terrestrial activities. And so I would go over to Russia and fly MiGs or zero G flights or do the uh, simulations of a spacewalk in the neutral buoyancy lab, uh, take centrifuge rides, that sort of thing. Uh, but then finally, we now do have the ability to privately go to space. And, uh, you know, in my mind, if I had to think of, you know, who to give credit or blame to for uh, opening up the civilian uh, space industry, you know, I think, uh, Peter, where are you? I know you're in here somewhere. But Peter back there in the back, I actually uh, regularly state, uh, I think, is the number one person who really made all this happen. He had the vision long before any of the rest of us uh, and began to found the organizations and companies that would be required to, uh, to uh, sequence the events that were necessary to open it up. And, which it now is. Uh, and then I would also credit uh, people like Eric Anderson, who's the president of Space Adventures, who kind of put, put what I'll call the business together, and even in the years when there was no space flight possible, uh, managed to keep the thing afloat and, glo and growing. Uh, and, you know, Space Adventures is now, uh, you know, has, has grown year on year after 10 years, and we've now put six people into space, which nothing, no one else has ever done. Just a really an amazing accomplishment. Uh, the chairman of the board of Space Adventures, Mike McDowell, who also has the only private company that takes you to, into the interior of Antarctica, charters the subs down to the Titanic and hydrothermal vents, and is kind of what I'll call a serial extreme travel entrepreneur. Uh, and then I would, in, I would like to include myself in the sense of I've uh, partnered with these guys and been their uh, investor and backer and number one client, uh, you know, down through the decades that it's taken us to pull this off. But more recently, uh, as you know, in October, I became the sixth private astronaut to go to space. Interestingly, I was originally intended and scheduled to be the first. But an interesting story about that was that since we hadn't funded the X Prize, no one was going to win the X Prize. And me and Eric Anderson were sitting down talking, and he goes, well, you know, if we can't go to suborbit, maybe we should go on to orbit. And I had just sold Origin, my first company, to Electronic Arts. I was feeling very, very wealthy. Uh, so uh, we talked to the Russians, and we paid the Russians a bunch of money to determine how much it would cost and how we'd be trained. Uh, when they came back, it was uh, well within or what we expected it to be. So I signed up to be that first person, and then the internet stock market crashed. And with it went all my money. And so we sold my seat to Dennis Tito, is the way I like to describe it. And, uh, uh, and so then I had to go build another company, go you know, uh, start over from scratch, basically. And as soon as I had enough money to pull it off, I signed up. And I've now spent all my wealth going to space. But, uh, but again, that's what I've been doing this for. So for me, it was uh, well worth it. And I think you'll agree if you, if you watch the journey here. <clears throat> you know, so. If you, if you think about, you know, what, it, what does it take to have the, quote, the right stuff to go to space now? Uh, as you know, it takes, uh, you know, to do it privately, it takes a big chunk of cash and a fair bit of time to go through the training. But there's also a bunch of medical work that you have to go through, uh, and there's a whole bunch of training that I'll, I'll talk about here, too. And the medical prequalification is uh, interesting, and you notice you see a picture of my stomach there with a you know, nice 18-inch uh, scar in it. Uh, that's because uh, I actually, they found uh, in the very detailed medical analysis they do of you in my case, they found something called a hemangioma on my liver, which apparently about 10% of the population has, and most people live and die and never know or care, unless you happen to be potentially involved in the rapid depressurization of a spaceship, in which case, hypothetically, it could uh, cause internal bleeding, which you couldn't diagnose or fix and would be fatal. And so they made me remove it, which I did. Um, then, uh, even after all that medical, you, uh, you know, you go to, you go to Russia and you go through more batteries of medical. So, uh, uh, you know, what's interesting is at first when I'm going through this, I'm going like, come on guys, we're just going to go float around in a can for a couple of weeks. This, you know, you're surely you're, you're, you're analyzing this in too much detail. Having now gone, I can tell you the physical challenge, the physiological challenge of spaceflight is actually considerably more, uh, apparent than I had expected, uh, pre-flight. And when I was over there, I really gained a deep appreciation for Russian space history. You know, I mean, think everybody, everybody knows things about Sputnik and Gagarin, and you, know, you, you have in the back of your mind all the first they have, but it really drove it home for me while I was there that other than landing a person on the surface of the moon, pretty much every other first there has been to have in space, they have done. And what I thought was interesting is that over there, they celebrate space history without regard to nationality. When you go over there, you see just as many uh, statuettes and, and posters about Neil Armstrong la landing on the moon as you do about Gagarin's first flight. And there are maybe not quite as many, but still plenty. And uh, they celebrate it in the continuum of space travel. And I can't say that I have ever seen in anything over here in the United States talking about space any significant appreciation of the work that's been done in Russia. And so I found it was, to me, it was you know, uh, almost embarrassing in a little bit to, to realize how well 
uh, celebrated our first war, but uh, how much we don't celebrate theirs, and uh, it felt a little bit of an injustice. Uh, and over there, too, you know, everyone who started their space program is still working on their space program. So I met uh, Tara Skova, the first woman in space. She saw me off at my launch. She helped me. She was there at my landing. Uh, Alexei Leonov, the first guy to do a spacewalk, same thing. He's a friend of my dad's. He's now my friend. Uh, the guys in the bottom right there, the uh, five of the uh, cosmonaut heroes of Russia, where, uh, you know, became some good friends of mine and would you know, kick around and together and things of that nature. So it's, it's interesting how kind of uh, still... Um, still alive, the history of, of space is there for them. And uh, <clears throat> for me, when I'm at my training, I had to be trained to what's called a user level in all the systems. Uh, on board a spacecraft or the space station, one person on the team has to always be what, call, what they might call an expert to be able to repair it and uh, uh, fix it. Uh, but everybody has to at least be a user level. And so for me, as a, a, you know, a, a private flyer, I was only required to, take, uh, to come up to mastery of user level. Um, it was also interesting to see that when you start in with the training, you know, how this weird combination of old school and new school. I mean, you've got these simulators, which are amazingly high-tech, cutting-edge, state-of-the-art simulators. And then you also go into the classrooms right next to it, and they've still got, you know, charts hanging on strings and using wooden sticks to point at it, no laser pointers. And you can see they've been repaired with the little stick-on labels when things have changed over the years. But, uh, uh, you know, they've, those, uh, the, their, their old-school methods, so to speak, are, are still in practice. Uh, and I had a, you know, quite a lengthy set of uh, classes to go through. I had to learn all the systems on the Soyuz, all the systems on the International Space Station, and those are you know, some of the training manuals, for example, down there in the bottom that were uh, heavily guarded secrets. I actually wasn't allowed to bring those back with me. They're considered uh, proprietary information because they now are selling training to other countries and things as they're trying to build their own uh, space programs. <clears throat> and so on the Soyuz, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting feeling to now realize I have this very specialized, very detailed, arcane knowledge of how to operate a spaceship. I mean, I literally can go to models or the real thing now, and I can tell you what every little bump and bolt and antenna uh, does on the outside. I can tell you what all the controls do on the inside. I can know how to not only power up all the different parts of the panel and radios and backups. Uh, you know, I know about all the phases of flight and when antennas come off or are removed or uh, uh, deployed. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's a, a, a wide variety of aspects of life support from, you know, uh, uh, oxygen and water and food and uh, the, the seat liner and shock absorbers and uh, your spacesuit and things of this nature that you have to uh, learn quite intimately. Um, the toilet, that's always a fun one. Um, and it's, uh, and of course, you know, after you go through the, the book work training, you begin to do, uh, that, that's what they call theoretical training. Then you get into what they call practical training, where you actually begin to put on spacesuits and get inside the simulators and uh, power them up to uh, simulate the actual events on board. And uh, I took this, uh, uh, this is a little side slide of a, a vacation, you might say, at the, on a long weekend. I went up to St. Petersburg, which, which I'd never been to before. And uh, uh, the reason I included this slide is uh, for just kind of a funny side anecdote uh, that in the upper right, that's a picture of me in front of a ship called the Aurora, uh, which is uh, what Lenin uh, rode down to, you know, basically uh, start the communist uh, revolution. And, uh, and just below it, you see the guy on a horse. That's a statue in St. Petersburg uh, to some of the aristocracy that put down a peasant revolt. And, uh, and, you know, I was thinking, going like, you know, most of the people are peasants. And if, uh, if the aristocracy put down our revolt and then put up statues to themselves about putting down our revolt, that statue would really piss me off. And, and so as I walked around in St. Petersburg and kind of saw this, you know, the, this, the collapse of the aristocracy or the violent overthrow of the aristocracy, and you, and you put that in historical context of this is also when other countries were also overthrowing their uh, uh, monarchies. I sat back and I went to my Russian trainers and guides who were with me. And I said, wow, you know, if, if I was there at that time, I could easily see that, you know, co you know, compared to a monarchy, communism could be a really great option. And they were horrified. They came up to me and said, quietly said, Richard, Richard, oh, don't worry. We won't tell anybody you're a communist. And, uh, uh, and I was like, no, no, you don't understand. But they never did seem to quite uh, get the uh, meaning of what I was trying to communicate. Um, you know, we also had, uh, we went into things like survival training, just in case you landed uh, off target, uh, which could be in the woods or the water or anywhere. Uh, if you look in the center of the, if you look at the bottom center photograph, you might notice there's guns 
uh, in those cases. Uh, there's actually uh, guns on board the Soyuz. And it's really funny when you hear people talk about it or on the, online when uh, you begin to, when, uh, when I blogged about it and you know, uh, saw people's responses to the, the fact there's a gun on board, you know, people are always going like, oh my gosh, that's really crazy. You know, you've got a gun on board, the spacecraft, and that means somebody's going to go crazy and start pulling out the gun and shoot holes in the side of it and kill everybody. And uh, you know, my response to that was, you know, once you learn these systems, you do not need a gun to kill anybody or everybody on board. There's buttons and switches and valves that you could easily uh, move into the wrong position or unplug that would uh, you know, uh, uh, dispatch anyone or everyone if you so choo chose. A, a gun is uh, the least of your worries. <clears throat> and then, of course, you had to start practicing some of the survival skills. Like One of them that was particularly tough was in case you land in the water, you have to take off your spacesuit and put on a sea survival suit before you pop the hatch. And there is no room inside of a Soyuz. I mean, it is, you are shoulder to shoulder, heels against your butt, toes touching the far wall, head touching the other far wall, control panel hatch. And so the only way you can change clothes at all is to basically lie across your friends and have them help you take off one set of clothes and put on the other set of clothes. It's very complicated, hot, and, and uh, miserable. Uh, you know, we had to do outdoor survival. We had to do uh, sea survival. We actually then, we had, the thing we had rehearsed a couple slides before, we actually went and did for real in a space capsule out in the water. Uh, and that's actually the first piece of training that I actually failed the first time I went through it. Um, when they put, just put us in the space capsule out in the water, and uh, by the way, uh, there's a little purple pill in the, on the bottom row in a little plastic bag. That's actually a, a temperature gauge that you swallow, and it stays inside your gut for a couple of days before passing out the other side. And, uh, for, but for the couple of days while you're doing the sea survival stuff, they use that to monitor your core body temperature while you're doing the simulation. And when we, the first time we tried it, you're in there and you're trying to change clothes and this thing is bobbing and weaving in the water and it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter as you're sitting inside the space capsule. And uh, there's this interesting problem where if you try to move too fast, you get exhausted. But if you move too slow, you won't be done before it gets too hot to continue working on the inside. Uh, which is what happened to us. And so it was interesting to be in a simulation and realize as it's getting harder and harder to work that you won't be able to finish. In fact, if they let us keep going, I'm going to pass out or die. I mean, I mean, seriously, you're going like, this is, I'm having a serious medical crisis if we continue going. Um, but uh, fortunately, the guys on the outside are monitoring it, and so they, they stopped the simulation. And, uh, and then that night, the crew that I was training with, you know, we sat down and we rehearsed over and over and over again on land to make sure we had a sequence of maneuvers down that would allow us to accomplish this goal the next time we went in, which we did fine the next two times. <clears throat> Dining on a Russian military base is not good. Um, in fact, it was so much the same and so monotonous for not only every meal of every day, but, but not only every day, but every meal of every day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner were basically the same thing. Only difference is at breakfast you got eggs with it, hard-boiled eggs. And, and in fact, it was so funny, I began to take pictures of my meals just to be able to do this and show everybody, like, look at this, this is really uh, astounding that, you know, you have a plate that has mashed potatoes or rice on the bottom, followed by some kind of cutlet or boiled meat on top, and, uh, and that's about it. And you get that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, plus a hard-boiled egg at breakfast. And, uh, uh, and, then if, and then if you try to escape the base and go eat at the restaurants that are in Star City, those bottom two plates are at the restaurants. <laughs> and uh, you notice they're pretty much the same. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, you, you have to also uh, go through training, and they have a wide variety of about 100 uh, items you can choose for your space uh, menu. Uh, but I have to tell you, after eating the first 10 of the 100 items out of a t basically a t can of tuna fish, you quickly realize that you're not going to be any, you're not going to do any better in space than you did on the ground. Uh, it uh, it was uh, fairly thin pickings for uh, good food, uh, which I think is kind of funny because a lot of the professional astronauts I talk with all say, "Oh, the food's fine," and I'm going like, "Well, okay, I guess you're you're not a foodie like I am." I found that to be one of my least favorite aspects of the journey. Then to we did a similar set of training on on the space station itself. Uh, you know, I had to learn the outside, learn all the inside. It's uh, you know how to operate all the radios. You know, the, what's funny is the the space station could really use a graphical over, user interface overhaul. Uh, they really need somebody in our industry to uh, to come in here and help them with this because uh, it is it's an interface that's been designed module by module over 10 years and then hack to continue to work together. And so to, for example, turn on an, a, a radio to talk to the ground on a, one particular VHF channel requires you to confirm that the settings of all these different connections down through the space station uh, are correctly set for you to do it. It's, it's, uh, it all works just fine, but it's, uh, it's uh, uh, much more complicated than I would have expected. Uh, then there's the toilet. And uh, 
Uh, you know, you, you know, in a modern toilet, you think you just walk up to it and use it and flush it. But the, 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 the uh, station toilet requires you first to come over to this panel where you have to power up the panel uh, outside the bathroom. Then on the inside, there's another little control panel. We have to generally keep it over here in the automatic mode to, uh, so that uh, there's also manual overrides you can use. Then you come to the main panel here on the, uh, uh, the toilet uh, where you'd power it up and you set up things called, uh, for example, the pre-treat dose so that when you actually initiate it, it uh, adds some acid into a variety of filters that's going to be using a little later and you see the fan cycle up and other things. Then you uh, have to open this little stopcock here, which actually turns on the, uh, oops, turns on the main uh, uh, airflow that will provide uh, suction, you might say, for the solids and liquids that you're about to deposit. Uh, and then you can use it, and then you can back out of that whole process to shut it all down. So it's actually you know, a complicated uh, thing to, to use. And, uh, and it's funny that you know, uh, I'd always heard that the most common question kids ask astronauts is how do you go to the bathroom in space? But I can also tell you that the most common dinner conversations amongst astronauts is how do you go to the bathroom in space? <laughs> and uh, especially just before flight. I mean, every night they're going like, okay, now, because you can't simulate it on the ground. And so everybody's worried about it. You've never simulated it. And, uh, and so you, you try to get as much information as you can before you get up there. Uh, but then I can tell you once you're up there, it's completely different than everybody talked about. I mean, it's, uh, and there's more interesting challenges. And if you really want to know about it at the end, I'll be happy to tell you. Uh, then there's the galley. Uh, you know, where everybody eats, and there's a little, basically a toaster for your tin cans that you can heat them up in. Uh, on the right there, that's the uh, water processing unit where you fill up uh, your drink bags and uh, other rehydratables with, uh, with water. And uh, one of the malfunctions we had on my flight was uh, that that uh, system electrically shorted, started spewing steam into the room. So, uh, the, the, the heating wires put off enough uh, gases that it set off the fire alarms, uh, and uh, so they had to shut it down and pull it out. And fortunately, they had a spare on board. So, so that's the first one. It was it's one that's been up there for nine years. Worked beautifully for nine years. Happened to break when I happened to be up there, and they happened to have a spare. Otherwise, I'm not sure what they would have done. But uh, you know, it's just interesting. Uh, you know how uh, those sorts of you know malfunctions of that level happened on uh, not a daily basis, but you know with regularity. <clears throat> Um, we also did some zero-g training. Something I've done a lot of already here domestically is fly the parabolic flights on the zero-g plane that uh, uh, Zero-G Corp and now Space Ventures uh, uh, own and operate. Uh, this, by the way, is a phenomenal experience. Uh, beware, once you try it, you will be addicted. I've flown over 150 parabolas before I went to space. Uh, I go, any, t any chance I get, I find an excuse to, uh, to go be with or fly in that plane. Uh, it's a very, very cool experience, and, and in fact, the microgravity you feel on a, on a uh, parabolic flight in an airplane is identical to the experience of being in space. It just lasts longer when you're in space, because you're still in space. You're not away from the Earth in truly zero gravity. You're, you're in orbit, falling toward the Earth, but missing it because you're going by it so fast. Uh, and so this really is, uh, zero-g flight is identical to being in space other than duration. Uh, you know, getting your own spacesuit made is pretty cool. Uh, there on the bottom left is a picture of me having my body molded. They actually put you in this metal aluminum tray. They have a bunch of people hold you down so you don't float up. And then they pour plaster of Paris around you. Uh, you know, it's not like modern alginator that people might use for making masks or prosthetics for movies. I mean, this is, you know, rock hard uh, uh, yeah, plaster of Paris. And so as it's setting up, they wait till it's just the right level of hardness to then they bring a big winch over and winch you out of the muck that you're now getting you know, slowly solid uh, solidified into. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, we had to do a bunch of testing on it. Once you get it, they, once they sew it up and complete it, you do a bunch of vacuum chamber tests on it and things of that nature. I also really grew to deeply appreciate what I would describe as, you know, what I call Russian family traditions. The Russians are great about, uh, much better than like the NASA families were when I was growing up. When I was growing up, either the, the, the male astronauts would go off and do their own thing, or the adults would go off and do their thing, but rarely was it the families would go to get together to do things. Uh, and in Russia, it's always the whole family. And uh, it always includes lots of food and lots of vodka. And, uh, and it's really funny that, uh, you know, there were, uh, there's, uh, there, were, there were lots of kind of jokes you might say about drinking, uh, you know, where, or, or, and some kind of real statements. Like uh, when I was with uh, getting my medical checkups and they're saying, well, do you smoke? No, good. Uh, do you drink? Yes, I'm with dinner, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Do the rest of your checkups. Say, okay, well, it's good you don't smoke. You know, you should really cut down on, you know, drinking that wine with dinner. Uh, vodka, that's okay. And uh, that was really, truly the doctor's advice uh, to me. 
And, uh, and so they do drink a lot of vodka over there, but it's interesting that uh, they're also still strangely responsible about it in the sense of I mean, if anybody has literally one drop of alcohol, they don't drive. And so there's not a like alcohol level that is the law. The law is if you've had a drink, you period at all that day, you do not drive. And they don't. And, uh, and so, uh, so even though there's uh, lots of vodka at social occasions like this, uh, people are strangely responsible at the same time. And again, just like I don't go on a vacation, I go do work. This is a list of my experiments. I won't read them all off to you. Uh, you know, I did a bunch of what I'll call personal research uh, that is uh, both for uh, fundamental scientific research as well as developing what I hope will, hope will be future businesses in space. I did direct commercial work uh, for, you know, work for hire, so to speak, for people who were interested in me doing work on their behalf. I did a bunch of educational outreach. I volunteered for NASA, ESA, and the uh, Korean uh, Space Agency's medical uh, research. Uh, and then I did some things for fun. Uh, for example, I filmed the very first ever science fiction movie ever made in space, starring the, the crew. Uh, I did a zero-g magic show and a juggling show with uh, Greg Chamatoff, who's a, a similarly like-minded uh, person. And, uh, and my father had pulled a prank that made it appear that my mother was with him on Skylab. And so I re revamped that same prank and played it on the Russian mission control. Um, and so here's, just as an example, I'll tell you about one or two of the experiments. One of them, this protein crystal growth, is I think the most interesting uh, activity scientifically that I did. Um, as it turns out, every biological function uses a unique protein. That includes good functions and, you know, disease function. And if you want to stop the progression of a disease, one of the ways to do that is to create a molecule to bind with that protein and that would shut it off. And that, mo that binding molecule is called a ligand. And one of the best ways to develop a ligand is if you know the precise molecular structure of a protein. And the best way to find the molecular structure of a protein is to use X-ray crystallography. But if you grow crystals on the ground, convection currents during the crystallization process uh, cause uh, uh, impurities in the crystal. And, uh, and you can't see down to the positions of hydrogen atoms, which is where all the uh, bonding takes place. But if you grow them in space, they, uh, uh, they're resolvable down to hydrogens, and that turns out to be very, very valuable to medical science. And even though this was demonstrated as far back as my dad's work on Space Lab, NASA and government agencies aren't really into it right now. And so it's a great opportunity for private, uh, uh, you know, uh, development. And so in my one experiment, I more than doubled the number of protein crystals ever grown in space, and I hope to be able to follow it up with uh, additional work that I'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> I also did a bunch of Earth observations uh, uh, photo photographically. My father on Skylab took the first photographic essay, essay of the surface of the Earth as humans looking down from space. Because the Apollo missions were headed to the moon and back, they weren't too much worried about looking at the surface of the Earth. And so I worked with the Nature Conservancy to data mine out of my dad's photographic ar archive from, from Skylab to see what pictures I could take 25 years later and show how the Earth has changed from the vantage point of a human in space in that 35 years. And so they helped find uh, you know, what I'll call scientifically relevant targets to do that with. And I have a few, uh, literally yesterday I got an email with a few of those results. Another thing I did that my dad had done too was my dad took the first ham radio into space 25 years ago on Space Lab. And so I uh, uh, did a, a, a bunch of, not a school context, but other kind of what I'll call celebratory acts uh, reprising uh, the, you know, on the 25th anniversary of, of that work. And in homage to my mother, I uh, both created art and did an art show in space. Uh, I flew a special watch that I'm wearing here, uh, the Seiko Spring Drive Spacewalk watch that they actually made just for space travel. And they made six of them, and four of them I took to space with me, and two of them are still up there right now uh, with uh, my friend Yuri Lonchikov, who uh, just took them on a spacewalk the other day. Uh, I did some work for DHL doing educational work. For my own company, uh, NC Soft, we did something called Operation Immortality, where we digitized people's DNA and took it into space, ostensibly in case the predictor, uh, the prediction of my last game, Tabula Rasa, came true, where the Earth is decimated by aliens. The the DNA, the digitized DNA we would leave in space uh, would be something that you know future, future people could rebuild humanity from. And I took uh, people's DNA, like Stephen Cole. Oh, where's my uh, my my Colbert report bracelet has, has disappeared. Uh, but uh, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, uh, took up Stephen Hawking's uh, DNA, and uh, over there to the right, uh, that's a guy that, co that codenamed the Diffuser, who won uh, season two of the uh, uh, Who Wants to Be a Superhero, that happens to live in Austin, nearby me. And again, uh, uh, you know, I did uh, a bunch of work uh, uh, with the uh, Challenger Center. 
uh, we're, are connected to uh, by uh, both the video downlink as well as ham radio to students around the globe. I did a lot of work with the British National Space Center, mostly again with uh, children. Uh, those medical experiments I talked about. And then you get to the point where, uh, you know, once you've prepared all that stuff, uh, you have to finish off your, your final exams, which are all oral and uh, a bit intimidating at first until they realized I was a pretty good student. And then it became kind of a sparring match between me and the trainers to, uh, uh, you know, once they knew I was going to be, you know, qualified or competent, uh, we, we, I actually really enjoyed the, the process. And my last trip home just before flight was actually a very, what you might call, melancholy time. I was really surprised how... Uh, you know, quiet I became on my final trip home. And it was, it really did, it really did feel like, wow, I'm, I'm about to leave the earth and go off into space. And I'm about, I'm doing something that, you know, technically is relatively dangerous. And, uh, and so it, it, it really moved me in ways that I was surprised to see that I felt uh, when I was there on my kind of final trip home. And only after that final trip, all the rest of that training had been solo. I'd been working basically by myself and with my backup, Nick Halleck. Only here at the very end did I actually meet the other crew members. I, I had met them there at Star City, but I didn't train with them as a crew until I had passed all my individual exams. Uh, now we did our final training as a crew. Uh, I also did made a trip over to NASA where uh, even though I spent most of my time on the Russian segment, uh, NASA at least wanted me to have some safety training about uh, uh, being in their segments. I made some trips out to a place like, for example, called Kaluga, where uh, a lot of uh, the initial thinking for space took, was done by a guy named Tsiolkovsky. Um, because of my uh, liver anomalies, uh, they, uh, they were not only checking up on me more often than they do most people, but especially they want to put me in centrifuges uh, to make sure that my liver was holding together. Um, we had to do hyperbaric uh, testing where they uh, uh, send you up to 10,000 meters. And uh, what's interesting about, you know, at 5,000 or 10,000 meters, physiologically, I didn't really notice any difference. One thing I did notice, however, is if you try to make a, a pop sound with your tongue or your lips, when you're up at 10,000 meters, the air pressure outside of your mouth is not much different than the inside, and so you can't make that popping noise. And, uh, and in fact, you can pull a vacuum on the inside of your mouth to its full volume and then open your lips. And it wasn't hard to pull a vacuum of that, of that, that size, and you get no sound when you open your mouth. So it was like, wow, you really are. You know, if you go to the top of Everest, you know, you're really largely outside the atmosphere. I had a final medical test, some final uh, 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 emergency testing. And then, uh, and then as a crew, we went through two full days, where one full day we stayed in the Soyuz, and then the next day, one full day, we stayed inside the space station, and we had this giant government commission and all the ISS partners and a bunch of TV crews all, you know, observing us for that 24, 48-hour period uh, to make sure that uh, we were ready to go. Uh, we were approved for flight, and there was much rejoicing, uh, which, of course, included plenty of vodka. And, uh, but we're still not quite done. I still had a software loadout to load on board, I had to pack all my stuff and weigh it down to the fractional gram uh, and get it approved to be taken on board. I had our official photos taken. We got a final briefing as to the current status of all the systems on the ISS so we'd know what parts were broken and what parts we'd have to be repairing when we got up there. And, uh, and then we went through a bunch of ceremonial traditions where, you know, the Russians are a very, what you might call a superstitious lot. And uh, there's things you don't do, like you don't shake hands through a doorway, and if you reach out to try to grab somebody's hands, they'll actually pull you through the doorway to get you on the inside before they'll shake your hand because it's bad luck. And there's a whole long list you see there of planting trees and placing flowers and signing in books and hugging a tree and all kinds of stuff that you do because everybody else has done it, and it's good luck to go through the same process. And so you go through the, all, the long sequence of uh, similar rituals as every other cosmonaut has done. And this protein crystal growth experiment we did also it turned out to be very complicated to get on board that spacecraft. Because here I was taking a thousand straws of, of a wide variety of biological materials from the United States into Russia, into Kazakhstan, cryogenically frozen to go in and out of all those country borders and had to get, you know, get all that what I'll call paperwork dealt with. Then we also, we needed to launch it frozen. And so that means we didn't want to load, you know, normally if you load something on a rocket, you load it days or weeks ahead of time. Well, we didn't want ours to unfreeze, so we needed to load it as soon before launch as possible. So we actually got access to it four hours prior to launch. And so, uh, uh, again, just to tell you how, uh, we, how I, I think the Russians do it really well is the, is the point of that, I suppose, that uh, it was really not a big deal to get access to uh, load stuff on. Uh, you know, my dad just carried it all over and stuck it on the rocket, and then we took it up. Um, you know, one of the things that the Russians really love to do, too, is put you in these spinning chairs. And, uh, and they believe that it helps uh, desensitize you to motion sickness. Uh, but, the, but the exercise is to get in the spinning chair, 
and spin until you get sick. And you can stop before you throw up, but you go right to that threshold. And every time you do it, you can actually go a little farther. And you really can go a little farther each time. Uh, and then as you get up to their maximum of 15 minutes, they add in other kinds of provocations, whether you're moving your head forward or back or rolling it and other things. And I got to tell you, it is not a good part of your day. When you come to the class in your day, the scheduled part of your day, where you're going to go to this chair, sit down, and spin until you get sick. And then afterwards, you're going to feel bad for the rest of the day. You're going to have headaches and feel slightly nauseous for the rest of the day. That is not a good part of your day. And, as, and we were in Baikonur uh, during our final preparations. We did it every day. And uh, however, I didn't get sick in space. So, uh, you know, maybe it works. When we did get to Baikonur, you know, it's out in the middle of, it's a, basically a desert wasteland, and it's just an interesting dichotomy to see all the camels and the uh, radio antennas, uh, you know, that are out there. And uh, that's also when I finally got to see my rocket, and I uh, got to sit down in it and, you know, uh, see it getting its final coats of paint and uh, its final bits of assembly. Uh, we began to, you know, test all the parts and pieces in an integrated and final form. Uh, got more, more tilt tables and spinning chairs. Uh, the... Uh, Another final briefing you got was how the rescue teams were going to be deployed. So then in case you abort off the pad, you know, if you, if you abort during the first stage and the escape tower fires, you're going to end up at some distance from the pad. If you get to the second stage before an abort, you're another distance from the pad. If you actually have a third stage abort, you, have a, you end up in the ocean near Japan. If you get into space, but you have like a, a leak, and so you need to re-enter, there's a path across Kazakhstan that you're going to be on that you could re-enter during. So they're going to have, they need people deployed all along that path. There's thousands of people they deploy just in case for every launch. And what's interesting is in 35 years, they've never had an abort. But in 35 years, they always put these thousands of people out into the field, you know, just in case. It was, it was very impressive to see the amazing amount of coordination that was required to, uh, uh, to do this. And we stayed at this really historical place, this you know, it was called the Cosmonaut Hotel, where, uh, among other things, they have trees planted by everyone who's ever launched into space there. And so uh, the first tree down the, the left of that LA you see on the upper left was planted by Yuri Gagarin uh, just before his flight. And every person who's flown to space since has planted a tree farther and farther down that length of, of that row of trees. Uh, and because of the timing, uh, you know, so we were, we were, when we launched, we needed to meet up with the space station. And so for some reason, the math worked out where every night, right after sunset, if you just walked outside, you could look up and watch the ISS go by. And so it was really cool to go outside every night, and m m usually on accident. I mean, we did it a couple times on purpose, but it's just as often you just happen to be out there at sunset and look up and, hey, there goes the ISS. And it was kind of cool to just go, you know, a couple days, I'm going to be there. Tomorrow, I'm going to be there. And even two days, 48 hours prior to launch, they have still not put the rocket together. It's still in pieces. And so we're going like, how can they do this? You know, how is it they're going to literally, in less than 48 hours, finish assembling this rocket, get it out of the launch pad, set it up, hook up all the wires, fill it with fuel, and get us into space? I mean, it was, it's astounding how efficient they are at this. I mean, this is normal for them is to not have this thing assembled until literally before it launches. Um, and the launch pad we use is the same launch pad they've used from Sputnik through Gagarin and every Soyuz launch ever since. So it's a cool, historic, uh, you know, uh, uh, spot. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, we got to plant our own trees as well in that LA. And the day before launch, they actually rolled the rocket out onto the pad. And this is, unfortunately, uh, it was one piece of one activity I didn't get to see personally because we were in quarantine in a way they wouldn't let us out here. Uh, but uh, my dad got to go out there, and a lot of my friends went out there, too. And uh, uh, did you guys get to go out? Did you actually watch it roll out and stand up? And, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, the... The, the, even the way this their launch pad works, you now ours all has like a, it, when our towers all peel off our rockets, there's explosive bolts and motors and machines that all pull the stuff away. Theirs is all just counterweighted. The weight of the rocket actually holds the gantry against the rocket to hold it up. And when it begins to lift off, the lifting of that weight means that these can just tilt away by counterweights. And so it's a it's a wonderfully elegant uh, design uh, that it, that epitomizes the way they've done all of the of their activities in space. And then finally on uh, uh, October 12th, uh, I got to take off. And there you can see, you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you see a person standing there just a short distance away from that rocket. Uh, that, uh, it's interesting that in the States, the closest anybody gets is uh, five miles, uh, three to five miles from the launch. The review stands for this are only about 800 meters away. So most everybody's only 800 meters away. 
But if you're bold, you can get uh, you know up to about 200 meters away, and uh, so it's uh, it's just amazing the what I call the different philosophy over there where uh, they look they go hey it's it's dangerous you know it's dangerous but if you want to stand there okay you know <laughs> and uh, after eight minutes of engine burn you're in space and uh, uh, you know in fact I didn't mention that the, you know the, the liftoff is really a, an incredibly elegant uh, sequence of events. Uh, you know, it, there's not a lot of noise, there's not a lot of vibration, uh, the, the launch begins very gently, uh, the G-load pressures increase uh, slowly up to about four, four and a half Gs, which is uh, not any worse than the bottom of a roller coaster, really. Um, so it's actually extremely comfortable, uh, and it only lasts eight and a half minutes, and when the engine shut off, you're in space, and this is your view out the window right here. And, uh, and so the views from space, of course, are spectacular, as you would expect. Uh, but you have this impression of looking down at the Earth that changes over time that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But one of the first things that struck me when you look out the window and realize you're both, you're really high up when you look out at the horizon, but when you look down, the view actually looks pretty familiar and you actually don't seem that high. Uh, and you also realize, you know, that if, if, for example, if this is the size of the Earth, you know, you're only 250 miles above the surface of the Earth, you know, maybe the width of a couple of fingers above the surface of the Earth. And you go, you know, this orbit better be mighty perfectly circular, and my vector better be right on, or we're going to re-enter on the backside uh, unexpectedly. And the fact that they can pull us off with such precision, uh, I was really astounded by when you realize, you know, there's, when, you, when you see how close you are to the Earth, you're going like, wow, there's just no room for error. It's got to be exactly right. And, uh, they, and so it's, I'm really impressed, not just the Russians, but the fact that we as a, as a species do this with regularity, with this level of precision and margin of safety, um, I think is, is really quite impressive. And just uh, every now and then now, you'll, you'll see little views from space uh, peppered in. And well, for the first two days, I lived on board the Soyuz. It actually takes two days for you to match speeds and positions in space to dock with the ISS. And so uh, your, uh, your, your total life is the descent module, that is the capsule that you went up in, plus another six-foot sphere, this habitation module, uh, that you can at least uh, uh, float around inside. And if you look at the bottom right, you'll see my sleeping bag there that uh, you just basically float wherever you want to to go to sleep. You generally use a string or a thread to tie yourself to a wall so you don't bump into each other. Um, uh, but, uh, but otherwise, you're just going to hang out. And there you can see when I recovered in the center there, you can see I got my snake back out of storage and, and put it back on. Then uh, uh, just more pictures of the Earth. And again, I'm just showing, th th this just struck me just because you can look at all that silt coming out of these uh, riverbeds and swamps uh, out into the oceans. And even though I didn't get the motion sickness style space adaptation illness, I did have... Uh, uh, what's called fluid shift, where it feels like you're hanging upside down from the monkey bars on a gymnasium, which for five minutes wouldn't be that big a deal, but after five hours kind of sucks, and after five days you're really tired of it and uh, had headaches and other things that uh, were really quite a nuisance, but uh, uh, you, do, you do eventually kind of adapt. And uh, now, uh, two days later, here we are, That's uh, this was taken by Mike Fink out uh, one of the uh, Nader windows uh, looking down. Uh, that's uh, the, the near vehicle, the Soyuz Team A-12 that I came down on. And you can see the little orange patch there is actually where they did a repair to it that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and the other vehicle is Team A-13 that I'm arriving in. Here we are arriving, and our first view is through the screen in the front because uh, our windows face the side, so you actually don't see the ISS as you're approaching it, except for through the TV cameras. Um, and then until you get very, very close, you can finally see it out the side windows there. And when you get on board the space station, what's interesting is there's this interesting uh, difference between the Russian side and the U.S. side. The Russian side is small, cramped, grungy, dimly lit, cluttered, looks like this. Then you go to the U.S. side, it is spacious, brightly lit, sterile, still a bit cluttered. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, there's, a, there's hatch you go through, there's a very striking difference. And, uh, but by the time I w finished my flight, I had a very different opinion of this gap that I'll talk about in a minute. Another thing that was really cool to look at was uh, sunrises and sunsets where you could really see the thickness of the atmosphere or the thinness, you might, even, it might be better to say, of the atmosphere. And you can see there on the ground, you know, the clouds are some distance above the ground here in this shot. And you look up through the rest of the atmosphere, and the rest of the atmosphere isn't that many m multiples of uh, the height of the clouds uh, before the atmosphere becomes too thin to, to, to refract uh, light from the sun. And 
And you, know, you think about that on the surface of the Earth. I mean, the, the, our atmosphere is just astoundingly thin. And that really drove home uh, the impression of uh, things like a lot of pollution that you see getting pumped into the atmosphere that I, I think I've got some shots of here in a minute. And there's my little uh, bedroll unrolled just out in the middle of one module that uh, was uh, where I called home for two weeks. And I noticed I used some bungee cords to simulate gravity and hold me to the floor. Um, I mentioned the uh, repair job they had to do on my rocket. The previous two Soyuzes had reentry troubles that they believe were caused by a lack of complete separation between two of the modules that need to separate before reentry. And so since they couldn't figure out what was wrong or how to fix it, they decided to remove, do a spacewalk, spacewalk and remove the explosive bolt that they think didn't fire. And so that, they put that explosive bolt inside this metal container there that you see that I'm holding, and we brought it back down with us. So uh, reentry was actually a, uh, uh, an interesting time for us because uh, there was, uh, you know, it was unknown whether we would have that same problem or not. It was unknown, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, you know, what, what margin of safety there was if it did happen. Uh, but uh, in our case, it, it wasn't, didn't turn out to be a problem. And, you know, a lot of people, the, one of the most common questions I've been asked since I flew is, you know, did seeing the Earth from space change you? Did you have this epiphany where suddenly it's, did I have this thing where, oh, we all live happy, happy, joy, joy in one world together, one small, fragile, you know, blue marble. And to be honest, I was very skeptical that that would occur for me, even though lots of people say that it would uh, or had for them. Um, and for me, when I first got there, it didn't it originally. But there's this impression that builds on you over time where I would actually say that by the end of my flight, it actually had. And I'll take you on kind of this, this, this journey. I had already talked about how when you look out the window, you know, you, if you look out the window toward the horizon, you feel very, very high above the Earth. But when you look straight down at the Earth, you begin to see things that are actually quite familiar. You see airplane contrails and uh, clouds that frankly don't look that much different than looking out the window of an airplane. In fact, the way I would describe it is, you know, if in an airplane you feel like maybe you're three to five times higher than the clouds, well, in lower, lower Earth orbit, you feel like you're 10 to 20 times higher than the clouds. And me and my dad did some rough calculations, and it turns out that's, you know, not far from accurate. And so when you look down, you actually see pretty much the things you would expect to see out of an airplane. And that includes, you know, I'd always, I was, uh, I'd fallen prey to the misbelief uh, that, you know, one of the only things you can see from space is the Great Wall of China. Well, I never saw the Great Wall of China, but you can see roads and bridges and farms and, you know, uh, pretty much you know, uh, ship wakes coming out of harbors and airplane contrails. You know, it literally is a very familiar view. It's just a little bit further away and you get a much bigger uh, amount of the view. And you're traveling over the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour, so a lot of it scrolls by in a hurry. And so you get to see a lot more, but, uh, but the type of view when you're looking straight down is, is, is quite familiar. But the first thing you notice as you start orbiting is weather systems because about half the Earth is always covered in weather, so you see a lot of weather and you get this sense of how weather systems interact with each other around the globe, more than you do out of books or uh, single satellite images. Then you begin to notice, especially over deserts where there's usually no clouds, so the next thing you can see a lot of is deserts, uh, you begin to notice what I'll call the large-scale morphology of the surface of the Earth in ways that, uh, you know, give you this empirical understanding of tectonic plate movement and things that uh, uh, I also thought really fascinating. Um, and again, this is just another, uh, you know, one of these examples of familiarity where, you know, you're looking down on a, a familiar uh, scene of uh, uh, Mount Rainier in this case, and uh, again, the airplane contrails going back and forth across it. This is, and it's, this is what it looks, looks like looking out by eye. Um, and, uh, but one of the things I noticed was that, you know, humanity is everywhere on the earth that is fertile. When you go across every continent on earth, if you're not over a city, you're over farmland. And if you're not over a city or farmland, it's extremely mountainous, it's a desert, or it's covered with ice, or it's a swamp. Otherwise, people are everywhere. And, uh, uh, and it really, and it's again, there's nothing, you, you can't really perceive that until you've gone around the earth over and over and over again staring out the window. And, uh, and especially when you go over places like Africa and South America where you see them doing uh, uh, slash uh, and burn uh, farming techniques, there are continent scale amounts of burning going on and just vast areas of smoke going up in the sky that I saw every day when I was in space. So I presume it goes on most every day, most every year and has for an awful long time. And, uh, you know, and I don't have the math in my head to know how big a, how significant contribute that is, but at least what I'll call from a feeling standpoint, it's a lot. Um, and it was very impressive just to, it, it impressed upon me. Uh, it, it, it left a big impression, uh, you know, how much uh, that that, that uh, took place.
Um, and now humanity is even expanding into the hard places. You know, uh, you know those are the Palm Islands and the world uh, there in Dubai. And uh, you know, you can just look out the window and see them just fine. And uh, uh, and also in the deserts, you'll see places where there's ancient riverbeds where they're pumping water up from underground. Uh, and uh, uh, and the uh, uh, and they're building farms now out in the middle of deserts that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just really surprised to see how quickly we're now filling in the, the non-fertile areas of the Earth. And, you know, when you look out the window of, this, of the spacecraft, you know, inside it feels all cozy and comfortable. In fact, uh, you know, there's not even things like I expected to see like oxygen meters or pressure gauges or these life support readings, you know, to, to know you're safe. And it's really surprising that though that information is available if you go through a few screens of laptops, uh, it's just not in your face, if you know what I mean. There's not even a thermometer or anything in there in your face. And so they, they really kind of manage that all from the ground. And, uh, and you're just up there in a shirt sleeve environment that feels very homey. And when you look out the window, it's both it's a, a beautiful, intoxicating view, but you also sit there and you think about it as you see through this crystal clear vacuum of space at the other parts of the spacecraft. You know, you go, it's a hard vacuum which would kill me. You know, there's radiation levels that would kill me. Uh, there's temperature extremes which would kill me. You know, there's just, it's right outside this window is, you know, death in a hundred ways. You know, it's, uh, it was another kind of just uh, impressive uh, thing. You know, the galley that has six people there, you know, eating at meals in the galley, but it's really only designed for, you know, two to four people. And so the only way to make it work is you use all the three space around it. And since there's really no up or down, you can see everybody uses the ceiling and the floor and uh, float above the table and turn upside down in order to get enough people around the water processor and other things. It's, uh, it's just a really funny thing to get used to, uh, that uh, this kind of lack of orientation. And it was really interesting to come up, you could come up to a module junction and, uh, you know, you always, nominally people would think of towards the earth as down and all the labels on things are labeled so that the earth is down. But if you close your eyes and face another module and then put your legs that way and open your eyes and think of that as down, you suddenly think like, oh my gosh, I'm going to fall into that pit. And it's really easy to just turn your body another way, just decide that this way is down and it, your, whole, your brain completely uh, rearranges it. <clears throat> this is my workspace and some of the experiments uh, that uh, I was doing in my, in my cluttered little workspace. Another fun thing I did is uh, before I started doing ham radio transmissions, I transmitted uh, slow scan TV by ham radio, and I took up a bunch of uh, test images, test patterns, and, and I overlaid them with text that said things like mutiny on the ISS or Richard Garriott takes over the ISS, and this is what I transmitted from space for the first day while I was up there, and uh, people, got a, people on the ground got a kick out of that. Or I also transmitted a picture of ham from space because of ham radio in space, you know, you get it. I transmitted pictures of my dad uh, when he was doing uh, the same thing. And, uh, and at the end, I'm going to see if you guys know the answer to these questions. So this is a, uh, you know, some of the questions I got from kids I thought were really insightful and told me how well they thought about the problems. And as I've gone around with this, most adults don't know the answers to these questions. Uh, and I had to both think about it hard or had a real good time demonstrating in space in, in the case of these. Uh, like, you know, is it hot or cold in space? Uh, you know, what happens when you open a carbonated beverage or what happens when you strike a match? Uh, can you burp in space, which, which I was actually wondering about myself, or are you going to, you know, if, if you stand on your head and try to burp, you know, it could be problematic, so zero G could be similarly problematic. And, you know, things like uh, magnets and radio waves. Uh, but at the end, I'm going to see if you guys know any of those. I talked to you about, I made some art in space that I'll be auctioning off for charities. Uh, there's uh, performing some of the experiments I did. When I told you about how I, uh, I, I took, uh, you know, the, I repeated this uh, practical joke uh, that my father had done on Skylab. And let's see if that comes up audio-wise. This one may not. There you go. So this is my... Skylab, Houston, AOS, Carnarvon, five minutes. So this, my father took a, 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 just a cassette tape of my mother answering a standard list of questions that the Capcom on the ground knew to respond correctly to. And so only a few people were in on it. My dad, the Capcom, my mom, and a couple of photographers from the local newspaper. And uh, so this is my mom kind of talking from Skylab, as recorded at Mission Control in Houston. Hello, Aspen? This is Skylab. Are you reading me down there? OK. And there's more to it, but I'll skip there. But I took up a slightly higher tech version. In mine, I actually uh, I played my joke, a uh, similar joke, on the Russian mission control. And, uh, you know, and I made mine in a PowerPoint that I could push uh, different samples. Excuse me. Is there anyone there? 
But that way, in case the people on the ground went off script, I could uh, choose hunt and peck for words and uh, play it in, uh, in real time uh, myself. Um, you know, I was doing, the, amongst the medical experiments I was doing, one of them involved drawing blood, and you tend to get dehydrated when you're in space, and they were trying to draw blood on me on the last day, and we tried seven times to draw blood, seven times, had no success, and ultimately they gave up, so uh, uh, I was a pincushion. Um, then it was, fortunately it was time to leave. Uh, you know, reentry, you know, j as smooth and comfortable and beautiful as launch is, reentry is quite different. Reentry, uh, you know, starts out uh, actually entering the atmosphere at 17,000 miles an hour is so fast you rip molecules apart. Uh, so you create a plasma, a fiery plasma that uh, around you that is actually hotter than the surface of the sun. So it's interesting to uh, you know come down through that, although it's still quite comfortable on the inside. It doesn't rattle or shake or it's not noisy. But once the parachute opens, that's like being at the end of a whip that gets cracked. So immediately debris is now flying around inside the space capsule. Uh, then when the heat shield is dropped, explosives go off underneath your seat, which raise your seat into a uh, shock absorbing capable position. Um, and, uh, and then finally, uh, you get to the ground, and uh, when you impact uh, with the ground, and I would call it an impact, uh, you hit with a substantial force, but the, uh, uh, but the seat liner and shock absorbers absorb that pretty nicely. So there we are about to get the ground. There we are, just, just getting ready to open the hatch. And we get pulled out, and uh, my dad was there uh, for launch. He was in mission control running my ground team, and he was there uh, uh, for me at the recovery helicopters. And then it actually took, just like it took a while to adapt to being zero-G, it similarly took uh, days to get your inner ears to work again, to where you, it could help you balance. Your vascular system didn't keep blood in your head when you stand up, so you tended to pass out if you stood up. And your whole body feels really heavy, and so it, it took days before you, you're kind of plodding along, and even talking on the cell phone would, would just be really tiring uh, for, for a number of days. Uh, and then, of course, got right back into the medical experiments and debriefs. Uh, here's some examples of some of the Earth observation photos uh, that I had taken. Uh, and uh, in particular, here's some comparison results. And these, literally, these are only two days old. I got these yesterday. Um, uh, where they're showing, like, I took pictures of a forest fire over here, and here's its match on Google Earth. Uh, here is uh, uh, my dad's shot of Florida on the left and my shot of Florida on the right. You can see the urbanization that has expanded, uh, you know, down in the southern Florida. Um, here's the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, my dad happened; it was full of ice when he happened to be there. Uh, I don't, I don't remember exactly what the month was, so I'm not sure what scientifically they'll pull out of this one yet. Uh, Lake Powell in the Grand Canyon, uh, Mexicali, looking again at uh, urban growth, uh, the Western African coast, and uh, here is some examples of uh, what the protein crystals look like that grow in those little straws that uh, I flew into space that we're studying now, and the the early results actually seem very good. The crystals we the control group on the ground versus the ones in space, the ones in space grew more numerous and more large and have actually diffracted much better than our ground controls. So the early results on that experiment look very good. <laughs> and so here's kind of my takeaways from this journey. You know, f f I actually think the Russians are doing something really right. They, out of necessity, have come up with this great, what I would describe as public-private partnership that I think grew out of the collapse of communism. When, when, when communism collapsed, the funding for science in Russia went to literally zero. And a lot of the Russian, uh, the heads of the Russian science organizations said, look, we got to find a way to fund our science. And one of the ways they chose to do it is they said, well, if we can find people who are willing to pay to go along for the ride, it will subsidize the entire venture. And whether that's, you know, the Mike McDowell, my friend Mike McDowell that charters the subs down to the, Mir down to the Titanic and hydrothermal vents, those are scientific expeditions that they take passengers on to pay for. Um, when, we, when we started flying our private citizens in space, you know, we're paying a significant chunk of the price of that launch of that vehicle that allows them to, uh, to not pass that burden on to taxpayers. In the United States, if you ask that same question, the answer is absolutely no, because we're more worried about how it will look to taxpayers who will go like, wait, we paid for that vehicle, and this private citizen is getting some benefit from public dollars that, that, it, that are subsidizing his, uh, his trip. And so they're both quite valid perspectives. I just think the Russian way works better. Uh, because I think everybody's, everybody would rather get the tax burden off the, uh, off the populace anyway, uh, and I think uh, the right thing to do is to get uh, private citizens and companies in, into, into taking over that burden and participating, uh, and so I think they're kind of ahead of us on that curve. 
Another another feeling I have, you know, I la- happen to launch on Columbus Day, so I like the Columbus metaphor of saying that, uh, uh, you know, b- back before people were traveling regularly across the Atlantic, it was such an expensive and risky proposition that only something the scale of a government could undertake it. Once you've proven you can get there back and forth safely, quickly, private citizens and corporations took over and the governments got out of traveling across the oceans. Well, the same thing needs to happen in space and is sort of happening in space, but not at the pace that I believe it should. Uh, that... Uh, uh, you know, the, we're, we're still uh, too dependent, I think, on uh, pu- pur- purely government answers. And you know that, that strange impression I had that I mentioned about how there's this division between the Russian segment and the U.S. segment? I commonly would hear over there talk about what I'll call the high-level political debates between the U.S. government and the Russian government about who's paying how much for what services, et cetera, and who's really doing the bigger job or the harder work in space. And it's a, I think it's an interesting and worthy debate. But I have to tell you that being on the space station felt to me a lot like the movie Fritz Lang's Metropolis, the silent movie from the 1930s where uh, the underbelly, you know, below underground in the city is where all the workers toiled in order to keep the thing, the city working. And then there were these wealthy people who lived in the upper opulent part of the city. And the Russian segment of the space station is where all the water is purified, O2 is made, CO2 is scrubbed, the only toilet is, all the batteries are to store power, all the propulsion systems, all the caution and warning, fire alarms, all the stuff that actually makes it live and work and breathe and exist in space is over here on the, you know, the crowded, uh, dirty, you know, uh, always in need of repair Russian segment. Then you go through the hatch to the U.S. segment, and it is a fantastic, beautiful, amazing laboratory. It's got astounding capabilities up there that we've spent 10 years and many, many billions of dollars building, and so far is basically underutilized. And, uh, and now we're talking about going back to the moon or Mars as our vision for space, which, by the way, I agree with. I, I think our government should be opening new horizons for us, and that's the way they should be going. But we're really, I think, at big risk of not using this thing we've now spent all this time and money putting into space. And so uh, I think it's really important that we get... Uh, we convince uh, NASA and our government officials and the, and the taxpayers and elected officials uh, to encourage private utilization of the space station. Because right now, uh, they don't really have it set up uh, in a way which uh, allows uh, it, it to be very easy. For example, it was very difficult for me to consider using any U.S. asset up there, even though I'm an American, um, because of uh, uh, what I largely call politics. And as I look forward to the future, you know, again, I started with saying how, you know, all of us in the high-tech industry seem to have this, this great overlap of interest into space. Uh, and, uh, and you guys are all well aware of not just Spaceship One hanging out there in your uh, lobby, but uh, Spaceship Twos are now being built. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, John Carmack, has a company, Armadillo Aerospace, down in Dallas, which is, I think, doing great work uh, also in suborbital space. There's two or three other groups doing suborbital. Uh, you know, you've got Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin doing uh, orbital work now. There's really great new things going on in space that I think are really going to open up uh, space, uh, the access to space to the general public. And while I think that suborbital will start very expensive, you know, in the orders of hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, the fuel cost is actually quite low. It's only a few tens of thousands of dollars. So I actually think over time, uh, I believe people who can afford a first class round the world ticket as a once in a lifetime vacation will be able to afford a first class trip to space uh, once in their lifetime or, or as many as you can choose or can afford. Um, orbital, however, I think is much harder. Uh, you know, when you're going to go up, to the, the suborbital, you just need to go to a certain altitude and come back. Well, going into orbit isn't how high you go, it's how fast you go. You've got to go 17,000 miles an hour not to re-enter quickly. And that's the real problem. You have to carry enough fuel to accelerate yourself up to 17,000 miles an hour. And then since you need a heat shield to slow down, you've got to carry enough fuel to lift that heat shield with you all the way up into orbit. And that's just a, all that adds up to just a heck of a lot of mass. You've got to get going really fast. And so I think as long as we're using chemical-fueled rockets, it's going to be many millions of dollars to go to orbit. And though there is talk of major breakthroughs of space elevators or laser shot uh, vehicles or magnetic railgun launched uh, capsules, which might actually work, work out, but none of those are what I'll call far enough along in development to where I would want to count on, count on them anytime soon. But uh, for the foreseeable future, though, I think that uh, orbital space flight is going to remain uh, somewhat expensive. But by the way, uh, you know, uh, uh, Charles Simone, who uh, most of you probably know, was one of the co-founders of Microsoft, uh, wrote Word and Excel. Uh, he actually flew to space just before me. He was the fifth uh, private citizen to go to space. He's also flying just after me. Uh, so he's actually going up in uh, March, on March 22nd. 
uh, or uh, I guess the launch is on the 25th, I guess. Uh, but anyway, there we have a there's a launch tour that if uh, if anybody you want to do what uh, what we've uh, done a couple times, uh, it's a truly incredible experience. Uh, there's more people you can see out there standing by the base of that rocket. Uh, the uh, uh, that's a, a fun thing to do. Uh, and another thing, you know, we have this. Uh, I, I described this uh, uh, zero G plane. This is a you know, wonderful, uh, specially outfitted 727 that uh, uh, has specially modified uh, aspects of it, like fuel tanks, so that while flying zero G, fuel will still flow to the engines. Uh, that uh, flies these uh, great parabolas that uh, I've done personally many times. We took uh, Stephen Hawking a couple of years ago, which was pretty cool. Um, and uh, well, in fact, there's pictures of both me doing it as part of a promotion for my last game, as well as Stephen Hawking uh, going there on a flight. And we're actually going to bring that plane here. We're actually going to fly it out of uh, uh, the Ames Moffett Field here uh, on June 28th. And so I'm going to actually come out here myself too, and and uh, and fly in it myself as well. So uh, this is an invitation to any of you who would like to come fly zero G. Uh, you can uh, uh, send an email over here to the zero G folks. And uh, and with that, uh, I will. Uh, close the formal part of this, uh, go to some questions, and I have some little videos if, if people are interested and want to stick around, I'll show some of the things like uh, uh, the, uh, the movies I made and of uh, reentry and uh, magic and uh, sci-fi and all that kind of stuff, uh, but I'll do that only for those who wish to stay after a bit of Q&A. So thank you. So yeah, I guess there's a microphone back here, yeah. So how does juggling work in space? Uh, what's funny is, uh, uh, you know, Greg Chamatoff, the American astronaut who, uh, uh, like me, uh, bridged the gap between two expeditions. He was part of Expedition 17 and also Expedition 18, and I was kind of on the bridge there too. Uh, he went up on one shuttle and came down on another shuttle. He's, that's called a Shrek, Shuttle Rotation Expedition Crew Member. And uh, uh, he's an avid juggler, which I knew before I went up. We talked about doing magic and juggling in space. And so I tried to practice a lot of juggling before I went up there. But of course, there's no gravity. And so juggling is actually, it, gravity is helpful in juggling. And so juggling, you can do bounce juggling very well because you can go really slow. And so for a beginner like me, it was actually great to be able to juggle very slowly bounce juggling. But also we did passing. We did a lot of passing. And we did passing, I'm sure there's never been done. In fact, can't be done here on the Earth because like one of us could be upside down, one of us right side up. We could just be floating at odd angles and still pass. Uh, but it actually had to learn new skills because uh, there's no curvature of the clubs or balls. So we would, when we first started, we would end up throwing them into each other. And so we had to, it, we actually turned out that one of us right side up and one of us upside down was the easiest configuration because that way when we would naturally pass, we, the balls would pass each other uh, versus collide. Yeah, yeah, I tried point dancing on the zero G flight, but it was fun, you can do it very slowly. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Any other questions? Okay, well then, uh, thank you all very much again. Uh, and uh, anybody that wants to stick around, I'll, I'll show some uh, videos here in just a second. Okay? Welcome. Oh yeah, the questions. So what do you think? Is it hotter? What do you think? Is it hot or cold in space? Yeah, so the, the, that's the, sci the scientifically correct answer is there is no temperature in space because temperature is a, a measurement of the vibration, uh, the rate of vibration of a molecule. Um, however, the practical answer, it also it depends on whether you're in the sun or in the shade. Uh, the vacuum is a perfect insulator. And so if you're on the sunny side of the spacecraft, uh, you tend to overheat. So you need an air conditioner in your spacesuit to cool you down. On the, conversely, though, if you get in the shady side, you radiate heat away from you through infrared uh, radiation. Uh, and you tend to get very cold very quickly. And so astronauts that are out on spacewalks uh, will commonly, their fingertips are hard to, even with the suit uh, 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 management of temperature, it's hard to... Uh, uh, keep your fingertips at a good temperature. And so you'll always see them, if they're in the shadowy side, they'll do things like stick their hand up into the sun uh, periodically in order to warm up their fingers before they go back to work for a little while. So it's an interesting problem. Uh, another one on there, I'm just curious if you guys figure this one out too, or if you know this one, uh, is uh, striking a match in space. Would it work or not? Yes, it would work. So you say yes? I think it would go out after like, igniting. You think it would go out after igniting? Now, now, what about if you're in space versus inside the spacecraft? Yeah, and what about outside? Outside, there's nothing to burn. No, no. So, uh, so, uh, so this was one that wouldn't let me test. 
but uh, but I believe the correct answer. You're you're very close. You're basically correct. But I, uh, the, the one exception I would say is uh, in space it should work too, uh, in in the vacuum because the match head has fuel and oxidizer, and then the striking provides the heat. And so while the match head is burning, it will burn inside or outside the spacecraft. I believe. Uh, but you're correct that of course it'll go out in the vacuum. Once the match head's burned, it won't continue to burn because there's no oxidizer outside. Uh, but inside the spacecraft, a match won't continue burning. Uh, it will go out because it's convection, the heat rising that takes the carbon dioxide away from the match head, then new fresh oxygen comes in below it that lets it continue to burn. And so when the fire alarms go off on the board of the space station, the first thing it does is turn off all the fans, which tends to put out all the fires because there's no convection. And, uh, uh, and you also do things like, and, and the corollary to that is, going to sleep in space is a very dangerous proposition because if you go to sleep in a place that doesn't have good forced air ventilation, you breathe in and out the same pocket of air and you suffocate. So, uh, you know, you gotta, it's uh, uh, everywhere, there, there's lots of ventilation all over the place just to make sure you don't fall prey to that problem.